Hello everyone, thanks very much for coming. Um, my name is Ben Stopford. I, uh, I work at this company called Confluent. Uh, anyone heard of us? We've got a few. So we're the company that sits behind uh, Apache Kafka. So Apache Kafka is like an open source streaming platform. Um, and a lot of people can, you can use it to, uh, as a messaging system, you can use it to, to actually deal with um, event streams as they move, uh, move around. And the company um, was set up by, um, uh, well, so the founders were the original authors of, of Kafka back at uh, LinkedIn. It was a project that came out of, Link, uh, out of LinkedIn. And um, I'm an engineer by, by trade. Uh, I've been an engineer for 20 years, actually, 20 years this year. And um, I worked on Kafka for a couple of years. I, I worked on the replication protocol. I did the latest version of that, uh, um, automatic data balancing, a few other things. And these days, I do a slightly different role. I work in the office of the CTO. And um, part of my role, I have like a, a small team. And um, we look at sort of some of the other trends that are going on in the industry. And we sort of see how like event streaming fits into that. So today I'm going to be talking a bit about um, streams and serverless and really focusing on like a, a couple of, sort of big category changes that are happening um, in, this, uh, in this industry. And we're going to look at like how serverless as a, as a pattern works and dig into some of the, the details of that. We're going to talk about streaming, stream processing uh, and Kafka also. So if we look at like um, the various different categories of infrastructure, you'll be familiar with many of these. Like I'm sure most of you build your systems with relational databases. Maybe you, say you also use like data warehousing, messaging, cloud, etc. There are a couple of like uh, bigger changes which are happening now. Um, so one is kind of like event, is this move to event streaming, and this is really kind of a, um, originates from a, the need to have like real time data spread around an architecture or spread around a company. So that's kind of one big categorical change, uh, and the other one is this this sort of and whilst that kind of that kind of evolves from many of these different uh, pieces of infrastructure, relational databases, messaging, etc., that kind of leads us to this event streaming thing, and cloud has kind of evolved to um, serverless architectures, which are again another kind of natural evolution. And um, in this talk, I, re I really want to sort of compare and contrast these two. Because you can kind of use one for the other, and likewise. But do they actually sort of compete? Do they do they complement one another? That's the kind of question that I wanted to get to. And uh, I also like also like to have like a, a bit of a warning up front with these kind of things. So um, anyone read the Innovators Dilemma? It's like a, a book by a guy called Clayson Christensen. It's got like a, a few kind of core ideas. Um, but like one, one idea I, I like found very influential. And uh, it's really this idea that, that disruptive technologies um, will prove themselves in kind of niche markets. And often these products are, are maybe like a, a, a little bit uh, substandard at the time they're introduced. And they take a, a while to kind of get better. And uh, this is, this is sort of forming themselves outside of the mainstream. And then they often will like displace the mainstream. And the, the author of this book sort of documents this with a variety of different technologies over history. And both of these technologies, actually serverless and stream processing, certainly the more contemporary elements are in. They're both quite mature now, but they still have like some rough edges. So it's not quite as easy as maybe like something that's really tried and tested, like Postgres. So I also think it's always good just to have that that little disclaimer at the start. Um, so the thesis of this talk is that stream processes provide a sort of database equivalent for real-time event-driven data. data. Okay, so it's like a different way of, look at, of looking at a stream processor. And serverless provides like a corollary to that. Right? So real-time event-driven infrastructure and compute. Um, so that might seem a bit abstract. Hopefully by the end of this talk, this, that won't seem quite so abstract. So let's start by looking at event streaming. So event streaming, um, I'm going to say uh, Kafka is probably the, 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 the main event streaming transport. There's actually a number of stream processes, but um, Kafka is like the main transport. And that's essentially a messaging system. So a messaging system is just a tool, a piece of infrastructure, which allows two programs to communicate with one another. So for example, you might have like a, a uh, you might have uh, an application, it publishes um, messages to a topic. That might be a topic of, let's say, orders. And you could have like a bunch of other, like maybe microservices subscribing to that. 
and uh, they can get that information and they get that information in real time and these systems kind of scale. And messaging systems, have, have, uh, as per the previous slide, have been around since the mid-1990s. So Kafka's like a, a little bit different. Right? It's actually a thing called a, a distributed log and uh, that means it can spread its data across multiple machines and uh, scale uh, horizontally and also provide like HA and you can like spread these things across different data centers and have like a global um, view of this information as it flows through your architecture or flows through your company. Um, it also, unlike a traditional messaging system, actually lets you hold data. So you can hold like large amounts of data inside a Kafka cluster, like hundreds of terabytes. Um, and then finally, it has this, this ability to do stream processing, um, which is really about manipulating data as it moves. So if you think about what a database does, a database lets you store some data and then run a query against that data that manipulates it and gives you back what you want. A stream processor is more about taking data that's in flight. Actually, running a query might be a program you write, but it might be a, some SQL query, um, which transforms that information. And we'll be talking about that in a bit more detail. So if we look at like an um, event streaming platform in its entirety, it's a bit more than just a messaging system and a stream processor. It actually has like a, a number of, of connectors. And these are often maybe overlooked. Robin, my colleague, has got a talk on this later on today. But the reason these are really important is that the whole point of doing this is that you've got uh, data which is held in a, a variety of different places. Like data these days comes from lots of different places. So you need some way of getting it. So you need to be able to extract information from a whole variety of different data sources. Some of these will be databases, some of these will be other things. And there are these connectors that kind of suck this information out. So you can actually very efficiently suck data out of a database, turn it into an event stream. Those events actually have a, a, a sort of very accurate journal of all of the information that the data had, that the database had. Actually often more than the database actually kept because like a an update to a value will result, uh, sort of successive updates to a value will result in multiple events being published. Um, so you can sort of feed this data set into this distributed log, uh, this messaging system. You can write applications which use these, uh, a simple API in pretty much any language which can also just use effectively, effectively as a messaging system. And Kafka Streams is that ability to, gives you that ability to manipulate this data in real time and then you can push it out to some other uh, s uh, some other sync, so that could be like a database or something. So these are used, uh, Kafka's used in um, like uh, a large number of companies, so pretty much all of the internet companies use this, lots of banks, uh, it's big and automotive, so you, you, it's pretty likely that you use Kafka today indirectly through one of the apps that you use on your phone. Um, and these things work at obviously very high throughput, right? So we, we can, I think we can sort of accept that. When we talk about the stream processing pass, which is this pass of this, this uh, technology that lets you manipulate data in flight, there's actually a few different options out there. Um, so these are kind of like three of the big ones. Um, Flink, uh, Kafka Streams, which is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to basically be talking mostly about Kafka Streams because it's the one I know, unsurprisingly. Um, and then Spark Streaming. Um, these are, uh, they're all like a, a little bit different, but sort of broadly the same. So a lot of the concepts we'll be talking about today, we can, we can apply to any of these. So where does this, um, this kind of fit in? So this is just like a, a bit of an introduction to like how event streaming kind of fits into a standard architecture. Um, you guys, pretty much everyone's built a monolith at some point. Uh, you probably built like a, a distributed monolith, maybe like microservices. So you have like separate databases usually per microservice um, so that you can kind of isolate uh, uh, the data and do effectively make it easier for you to like release updates to different components at the same time. Um, this works particularly well where you've got multiple teams. And normally in these kind of architectures, you're actually joining things together on the front end, right? So you might have a user interface and it calls a bunch of services and they do different things and they're nicely isolated. Um, the, the sort of path into um, event-driven microservices tends to come when you want to build like stuff on the back end. So maybe not, not stuff that's like responding to a user clicking a button and expecting something to happen, but rather is doing something a bit offline. So like think fraud detection. Um, or you might be like uh, pushing data into a, into a database for doing reporting. Um, or you might be updat updating like a billing system or any of this stuff that's basically offline. So that's like, the way you do that is you, each of these microservices would start to emit events, might be taken from a database, it might be taken from an application, and then you sort of start to collect this event stream which then you can reuse for a whole bunch of backend things. And then these, the patterns of these kind of fall into probably two like broad camps. 
Um, so one is you like have a bunch of different event sources coming from these various different places, and a stream processor can be used to sort of join that data set together and push it into like a database. Um, so this works. Uh, this is often used with like particularly with databases that don't support joins well, or databases that are very read optimized. So like a, a data warehouse or maybe like something like Cassandra, um, like a serving layer. The other one is uh, the other pattern that you see a lot. So that's sort of you can think of that as ETL or view creation or um, stream processing. The other one is like a, a as a sort of event-driven microservices framework. That's where you actually build little microservices. They actually use the Kafka Streams API, which is just an API that ships with Kafka, and um, they can that API will let you bind data together in flight, and you can just build little microservices that communicate through events. That's not a topic for today. It's a much lo a larger topic. Um, but it's just to give you a little bit of context. Okay, so that's a little bit of, of an introduction on um, events and how they kind of fit together. What about serverless functions? So anyone use serverless functions today in production? Great, we've got a few. So um, for those of you who don't, who don't um, it's a very, very simple idea. Right? You write a function, you upload it to a cloud provider, and you create some kind of trigger. And one of the nice things about this is you have like a whole range of different triggers. So you might credit from hitting an HTTP uh, um, a gateway. You might create an event. It could be an event in Kafka. It could be an event in like a, one of the native um, uh, messaging systems. You could be writing to an object or a database. You can trigger these things off timers, etc. And like the canonical example of this is uh, is like resizing images, right? So you have like a imagine you've got like a website and you've got some images and you store these images in like S3. And what you actually want is like a thumbnail, like a little thumbnail image. So you write a little program which creates this thumb thumbnail image. And uh, instead of having to like run, like manage a server or boot a VM that runs your little program, you just write it as a function and you upload it. And every time you write to S3, it creates an event. And the event then triggers this function, and it creates a thumbnail, and it, and it uh, stores it back maybe in a, a different bucket. So that's like a, that has like a couple of nice advantages to it. Firstly, um, actually, the way you're charged is, is pay for use. Um, so uh, if you only upload images occasionally, well, it doesn't cost you very much, which is wonderful. The other nice property of this, uh, the property that it has, is that um, uh, if you write like, one image, you'll get like one function invoked and like one thumbnail created. If you write like a, a hundred images at the same time, it'll actually, because it's event driven, you get like a hundred events and it'll actually boot like hundreds of these, a hundred of these functions at the same time. So you get like this really nice sort of distributed compute, sort of for free, um, which is like a really nice property. So there's, there's, a, there's a really cool paper. Uh, anyone read this paper? Um, so this is a, basically a bunch of academics and they did a, uh, they kind of reverse engineered uh, sort of three of the big cloud providers. Right? So Amazon, uh, Google, and Microsoft. And um, uh, basically just like worked out how they work, like do the various different parameters that they, that they offer, kind of work well, do they have um, uh, good resource sharing, are they, are they do, do they have good uh, isolation, et cetera, et cetera, how long do these things actually take to run in practice, these kind of things. And I'll, I'll reference uh, these and, and some of the other papers at the end. So if we, uh, this kind of gives us a, 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 some information which allows us to kind of bound these things and understand how they work. So they're kind of fully managed, right? So you have like a, what's actually happening when you run a function is it boots a little container. And the little container has in its inside it the code that you wrote. And an event will trigger that code to run. And it may return a value, it may not. Um, uh, and then you're actually only charged, as I said, for the function execution time. But you have this wonderful sort of scalability property that you can create like many of these things at the same time. And because the whole thing's event driven, it means that you can very easily like sew together events that come from a whole variety of different data sources, which is actually pretty important when you're building um, contemporary systems because you tend to be using a lot more technology. Actually on the cloud, you're actually more incentivized to try different technologies out because Actually, the, you don't have that, like, that cool like, like bootstrap time. You don't have to worry about all of the complexity of understanding how to run this particular piece of technology. You can just kind of use it. Um, so you're actually likely to have more of these in the future. So this event-driven nature gives you this order scaling property. It's actually the backlog in the queue that's sort of driving how many of these functions um, will be invoked. 
Um, so a service shut function itself is actually pretty short-lived. Uh, it's typically about five minutes, and um, they can actually be pretty slow. So um, uh, 100 milliseconds actually to, to 45 seconds based on that particular paper. And this, this really comes down to um, how, you've, how uh, the underlying infrastructure is actually invoking the function. So if you invoke it for the first time, it takes like a, a while to boot that container up. So you can have this like very sort of potentially slow invocation time. But then the container, once the function's finished, it kind of hangs around for a bit. So that, because it's sort of expecting you probably, there's a good chance you might get like a, another event to run the function again. So it kind of keeps it around a bit. And you can actually do tricks to try and keep these things running so that you don't get these like really bad pauses. Um, but there's some, some variance in that. So where is this useful? Well, it's actually useful um, in a number of different places. It's obviously particularly useful for spiky workloads. Right, so for anything where you're just like not using it, you don't want to need the functionality for like a long period of time, um, or you need um, a very large amount of resources, maybe also periodically. So like I know like I have a friend at Amazon, so he spends a lot of time looking at like grid compute workloads, which are actually th tend to fluctuate quite a lot. Um, the economics are it's about seven times more expensive, um, but actually for many people that kind of averages out and it's actually often much more beneficial. So, but I think like the, probably the most interesting use cases for me are actually ones that you just wouldn't really think of. Um, so for example, I, I'm gonna pick like a, a CI system. Right? That's like not a very interesting use case, you might think. So continuous integration, right? So it's a continuous integration server. You're probably never gonna run a Kubernetes cluster to run your, your uh, continuous integration server. Um, you might well outsource it to somebody else. But actually, being able to run something like that on a thousand functions so that your build completes really, really, really quickly is actually quite attractive. So for, so for me, like this, this type of event-driven infrastructure uh, actually opens up a lot of possibilities, particularly for parallel computation, things which are effectively embarrassing, embar embarrassingly parallel, things we can parallel parallelize really easily. Um, it kind of opens up that kind of programming to like uh, much more mainstream use cases. And the final one is like actually as a general programming paradigm. So I talked a little bit earlier about how streaming can be used as a sort of general programming paradigm for, for microservices. Um, you can also obviously use it for serverless functions and the ecosystems they create uh, to build like quite complex programs. Um, so in the future, it's quite likely we'll end up doing the whole thing in, in, in a serverless way. So Camille Fournier wrote, uh, I wonder if serverless services will become a thing like stored procedures, a good idea that quickly turns to technical debt. Um, so anyone agree with this? No one's got an opinion. So I actually think it's, pr it's probably like a little bit unfair, right? Um, I don't know if any of you ever worked with stored procedures, but probably the biggest problem with sort of stored procedures is you ended up writing like business logic in uh, SQL, which is like not actually that much fun. Um, I think the point that she's really getting at, though, is that like a database is kind of like this black box, and in a stored procedure, you like write some business logic and you submit it to the server, and it's like really hard to work out what it's doing, and if it's calling other stored procedures, it's really hard to reason about, it's really hard to test. Um, it's kind of like Basically, the whole thing's like quite hard to manage because it's really opaque. So is the same true in a serverless world? Well, I think this comes down to really the developer ecosystem. Right? So what you really need are like really good runtime di diagnostics. You need really good monitoring. You need like a deployment loop that actually works the same speed that you do, right? which means probably pretty fast. You need to be able to test things easily. You need like an IDE integration, which just naturally works with this environment. And um, some of these things are actually coming. I was glad to see IntelliJ recently introduced a uh, service integration. Currently, I'd say this is like so-so. Like, it's okay. It's not like brilliant. It's like, okay. Uh, it's kind of getting there. But uh, it's probably going to change. Right? So at the moment, it's like uh, building a, a server system, um, I think, is, is, is a bit harder than a, than a normal approach in some ways. Um, but there's about... Uh, I don't know what the share price is today, but it's probably like a two and a half trillion dollars worth of market capitalization, um, which is very incentivized to make this thing work. So it's quite likely that these three guys and the various other cloud providers um, are going to push in this direction. Because 
Um, th is, they're very much incentivized to get you to run your software on their infrastructure. They all have sales guys, sales guys like nice, nice cars, all that kind of stuff. So in the future, it seems unlikely we'll actually probably manage our own infrastructure. For most things, we're going to probably outsource it because it's competitive advantage. It makes sense. So Sam, uh, Sam wrote, uh, so Sam Newman, who's uh, basically Mr. Microservices, and he's a friend of mine. Um, people, who, he wrote, people who think serverless will solve all their problems will probably end up sticking uh, all of their something uh, in one giant database. So Sam makes this reference because he's Mr. Microservices and uh, likes microservices, as many microservices people do, to have their own database. So event streaming takes a slightly different approach to this problem. Um, let's have a little look at that. So FAS, serverless functions, are event-driven. They're not streaming. Okay, so what, 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 what do we mean by that? It's a little bit subtle. So um, let's take a, a really simple event-driven application. So we have like a, a few different event sources. We have a, a customer's event source, an order's event source, and a payment's event source. So these just could be like microservices that are managing this data, and they're just emiti emitting some, some streams of events uh, as whatever their event source is appropriate to them. And these are the streams of events. And like, we want to like, build like, a really simple application, like a, maybe like a simple function that just like, sends an email. Simple, simplest thing that we could possibly have. So um, we kind of need information about the customer, information about the order, and information about the payment. So we might take these two data sources and like, put them in a database. Uh, we could actually be calling a service interface too. It's actually exactly equivalent. Um, and then for the payment source, event source, we would actually use this as a trigger. Right, so this is the thing that's going to trigger our functionality to run. So when a payment event arrives, this serverless function is going to run. And we're going to have to look up the corresponding order and the customer information and send our email. That should be pretty self-explanatory. But there's actually like a, a couple of little subtleties here. So firstly, like this, these two data sets are actually happening in pretty much real time. So when you create an order, you're probably going to create a payment about the same time. Um, the customer information isn't. It's just been stored around for a, for a while. You probably didn't update your customer information for quite some time. So there's kind of a timing issue here. Like if I, if I react to this particular event, well, the order might not be there because this is an asynchronous system. So I might have to like poll a bit and see if I can actually get the right order. Um, so you have these, these kind of timing li limits. You also have some sort of scalability limits too. So if you're thinking about this in, in a world of concurrency where you have multiple concurrent functions, um, you might actually end up kind of denial of service servicing attack that database. So you have to find like a more scalable database, which actually means you have to make some other trade-offs often. So if we did the same thing in streaming, we just do it in a slightly different way. Um, and effectively you do it we would do this using a stream processor, and the stream processor is just going to put, pull all of this information together for us. So the customers will actually be held in a table because we need to do a lookup by key on customer. Uh, these two real-time data sets would be ingested. So this is like a single application. We can just imagine this is like a microservice in Java or something. And uh, the streams API will actually deal with that. It will deal with the, the fact that this data can come in any order. And actually, our application logic just gets presented with like a a version with a, with a tuple, um, a single kind of object, as, you, as it were, which has like all the information that we need in it, and it'll just send the email. So it's actually pretty simple to implement. So in Kafka Streams, it looks something like this. Right? So you've got like a filter. I'm filtering out just one type of order, and then I'm joining, doing a join. I add some code, which does my, sends my email. And I've got a, I'm sending actually another topic, um, just so I have a record of what emails were actually sent. But, so, you, so that's like the API approach. I have a Java process. I just use one of Kafka's client APIs to do that. So like very simple. Um, but actually, there's some overhead, because the complexity is that inside my application, right? because it's a library. I can also run it as like a server process. So if I run it as a server process, um, it's, this part is basically the same thing's happening again. But now, the application logic's separate. And I'm actually going to send some SQL. So I'll send some SQL to this server. And it does exactly, exactly the same thing. It, it joins these real-time data sets together. It does an enrichment. It creates um, a new message, a new event, uh, which has got all the information in. And then the application logic just subscribes to that. And now I can use like any language I want, which is quite nice, because Kafka's got like a, a binding for any language. And I could send my email. 
So that's kind of the streaming approach to solving that problem. So we're event-driven first, where we're sewing stuff together from the function or from the microservice ourselves, and the streaming approach where we're basically pre-preparing our data and sending it to the thing that's going to actually do uh, the application logic. So event streaming is really about, um, or one view of it is, to, is it's about the, the provisioning of this real-time data, actually with contextual information that we've looked up, and like pushing that into our application logic. It's like a little bit different to the way that we normally deal with data, where we just like, like maybe have a program and it just sews data to get together in real time by making requests and responses. So I just wanted to explore a little bit more about how this actually works, because I think this helps um, like really set what's going on uh, why this is different by looking a little bit at the internals. So if we look at those different operations, there's a few operations going on there, and um, there's, a, there's, there's a, a few different other tools which are available to you. So one is this streaming join. So this is like the join between the order and, and, the, uh, and the payment. So this, is, this is all happening at the same time. So we have, in this case, we've got two streams, stream of orders, stream of payments. And uh, we've actually got like two things going on. We've got like Bob's got an order and Jill's got an order. And Jill has a payment, and Bob has a corresponding payment, and they're actually like out of order, which is per perfectly permissible. This could obviously happen in the real world, um, and we want to kind of join them together. And this is a, a stream processor that's doing this join. It's like a single line of code. So as this thing kind of progresses, these events are sort of coming into the stream processor. Uh, Bob's payment, you can probably tell, is about to arrive first. So when Bob's payment arrives, it actually gets buffered. So it gets put, put into this buffer. And um, actually, this buffer has to be like relatively clever. Right? So for, for it actually has to, be, um, has to be stored on disk. It actually ha also has to be stored in Kafka. Um, and the reason for that is that these services run on, uh, uh, the, the, these stream processes can run on many different machines. Uh, they can fail. They can recover themselves automatically. And to do that, right, the actual content of the buffer has to be effectively transactional if, if you're going to get like, the right result all the time. Um, so you have to be a bit careful with that. Um, so next, like Jill's order comes along, and Jill's order gets buffered. Um, uh, payments continue. Jill's payment is going to come in next. So we've got other events being uh, added to this buffer. Jill's payment hits. We actually get a match. So we actually look up the corresponding value in the other buffer, and uh, we'll actually get um, a tuple come out with Jill's order and Jill's payment. And uh, we also notice that we remove the data from the buffer, obviously. So there's like not too much state being held. And then Bob's order finally comes in a few other events. We get a match, and Bob's order pops out the end. So we're getting this resulting stream of these two things joined together. We can also do a stream table join. This is actually, um, sounds kind of similar. It's actually completely different. Uh, it's actually much simpler in many ways. Um, so in a stream table join, uh, we're joining orders with customers. So that stream of orders, and we're going to like just literally do a lookup of of, uh, of customers in the, in this table um, by key, by primary key. So this is actually all happening inside the stream processor. It's not like separate processes. It's all one process, and um, the the data is being like overflowed onto disk, and it also ba also will be in Kafka. So to make a table work, you've got to have like some kind of event source. So here we might have like an event source somewhere else. Like this could just be a database of of, uh, of customer information, and we could use Kafka Connect to suck the events out um, to get the data into Kafka, so that we can then reuse it in different things that we different uh, um, parts of our application. So with the with the data in the table being sucked out and constantly updated into Kafka. It will then, um, actually the first time we boot a stream processor, it has to like load this table. And this table is actually loaded, um, it's actually loaded incrementally. Um, and so there's an sort of initial load phase and then it just keeps, keeps it up to date based on this like the ordering inside this, this messaging system. Uh, and so the data actually in this case will have to be stored here as well as over, over there. And uh, this is actually a, a pretty common, common pattern. So th uh, things like Snowflake do a very similar thing, where they have uh, Snowflake for Snowflake, like something which, which is a, uh, a cloud-based database. Um, this is a, a S3 rather than Kafka. And we're, we're, we're pushing the data into this table. And then once we've got the data in the table, it's actually a really simple computation. Right? So order comes in, you actually just look up the value, and out pops the, the joined result. So we've got order and customer together. But there's one thing to note here that's important. Tables are stateful. 
Right, so this is actually could be a reasonable amount of data. This wasn't so much the case for the stream. The stream just had the buffer. So it was only like recording like stuff that was that was actually late. That's actually what's being recorded. Because once it's a match, it's removed. So it's a little bit stateful. So we have to bear that in mind for later. There's a few other things which are worthy of note. You also have we can use these tables uh, to write to. And actually if you're using Kafka streams, you can create one of these tables, it's got nothing in it and you can just use it like a database. You can write a program that just uses it like a, a sort of key, very simple key value database, and it, the, all of the data is backed up to Kafka. Um, and that, that's useful for a couple of different things. It's actually used inside something like KSQL to do a lot of sort of summarizing operations. So if we have like a stream of events, often we don't, we're not just interested in like one event, we're interested in multiple events. Um, so we might want to have, a, well actually, I have an example. Um, we might have a, a stream of payments, and we might want to keep like the total balance. So the total balance for Bob is five hundred dollars, Sally two fifty, George thirty two. So we can have like a computation, and we'll, we'll actually keep that table um, inside the stream processor, and uh, and keep that running total. We can also use windows, um, for example, in fraud detection, which basically just create a summary over some period of time. Uh, so we might have like a, uh, we might be. Uh, aggregating, it's called, data, summarizing data, or maybe like a one-minute window, a five-second window, a one-hour window, whatever it might be. So for we can actually chain these operations together. And if you, if you know anything like the way a database works, um, is it actually takes a, a number of different operations, selects, joins, etc., and it actually represents them as discrete operations, and then chains them together. This is actually very similar, but you can do this inside your own functions, um, inside your own stream processor. So a uh, very simple example, we might take that table in this case, which is also represented as a stream inside the stream processor, and we might just do a, a simple calculation that says, well, if the balance is below zero, then I've gone overdrawn. So if I've gone overdrawn, then I need to send out an overdraft notification, and I also need to like, maybe like credit uh, or debit an, an overdraft, char overdraft charge. And then finally, the whole thing is like wrapped together with transactions. So that's like a, that's a relatively complicated feature, uh, very, very simple to use. You just turn it on, and it just becomes transactional. So what that really means is that if I keep doing the same thing, I always get the same result, which is kind of what you expect from a database. So the only one thing I wanted to add about that is that transactions only work in Kafka. You can't get a transaction to work between like Kafka, a streams application and some other database or something else. It only works in the context of Kafka, which is exact, actually exactly how a database works. Like a database, like a transaction in Postgres actually only works inside Postgres, right? So it's actually not unreasonable. And then finally, queryable state. I'm not really going to talk much about this, but just to say that when you create these tables, you can actually query them remotely if you want to. Um, but I'm not going to dwell on that one. So let's compare this back to serverless functions. So service functions, um, they give us like this really nice auto scaling feature, right? So based on based on the amount of events, the amount of load, we can like spawn lots of different functions at the same time. Very simple programming model. It's a function, just like you write a function in a normal normal language. It's stateless. Actually, a lot of that auto scaling, that ability to auto scale, is based on the fact that th that these things are stateless. Latency can be a little bit high, and you're limited to basically to like one event source. Um, a stream processor uh, is actually a bit different. So it can do both stateful and stateless operations. Actually, most things are like a little bit stateful. Uh, they don't have to be, but most of them will be. And tables can be actually very stateful. Um, but the main thing that it's focusing on is joining data that comes from different event sources, bringing it together so that you actually have like something that's much easier for you to consume. Uh, you get correctness after failure. You get these sort of rich semantics for doing these complex uh, data flow programming. And um, it will scale automatically. Right, so I can extend, it can, I can increase the size of my cluster, but there's nothing today that actually will do that on load. There's no like auto scanning feature built in. And it's arguably like a little bit more, more complex um, because there's basically more data operations going on. So whilst those are the kind of similarities, I actually think that the, the differences are, are, are maybe like more compelling than the similarities. Um, so, and, and this really comes down to like what, how, these, how these technologies have like different comp competitive advantages. So I can actually write a very simple stream processor using a serverless function. I can actually write like a sort of maybe a serverless ecosystem inside a stream processor um, if I use like a, a cloud instance, a cloud version of a stream processor. 
But the competitive advantage of each of these technologies is actually pretty different, right? So the, the serverless is really ca catering for this like stateless event-driven compute. So what it's really good at is like a resource sch scheduling, provisioning um, VMs, working out when to recycle instances. You don't want to recycle them too quickly. You don't want to leave them for too long. Um, tenant isolation, making sure that like you don't have like noisy neighbor problems. Um, <laughs> making sure that you are actually secure. Right? These are actually as a as a company that has a cloud product. Uh, these are actually relatively difficult problem to solve. Um, I can see from first experience. So stream processors specialize in something a little bit different. They're really specializing in combining, filtering, transforming, summarizing real-time data from many different places. So that's their kind of specialization. It's a little bit different. So how do these differences actually relate? Well, I actually think they kind of complement one another in much the way th the way that like a database um, complements like a, a traditional application architecture. So if you think about the way that you built, we built applications for a long time, and uh, the general way we do it is that we try and keep our applications stateless. And we do that because we want to make it like, easy for us to do releases. Um, we want to be able to like, scale things out. We want our lives to be easy. And we keep, we keep our like, state in a database. Right? That's like a, it's like, like, a bit more stateful, a bit less elastic. And uh, that kind of makes our life easier. So high elasticity in our application layer, a low elasticity in our data layer. Uh, typically, and this is really because state itself has weight. Like, if you s expand from like four machines to like ten machines, and data has to move, then it takes time. You don't get as good elasticity. So it's much harder to do like elasticity with uh, uh, certainly with the actual data storage layer. So the same concept applies in a streaming application, but it's just like a little bit different. All right, so we might have data from several different. So this is like a, an example of like a, a streaming application, like. No, not service, just streaming. So we have like several different event sources. Again, I'm using customers' orders and, and payments. And with this, the, the stream processor is um, pulling those, da that, that those data sets together and creating this event stream, which we can then just subscribe to from this, in this case, a fraud service. Um, so actually, the interesting thing about this is that the fraud service has sort of got all the data that, that it needs. And the stream processor is doing the stateful operations. So it has like less elasticity. And the, the full service is stateless, so it has like slightly better elasticity. And that's this, this model is actually using stream processing um, as, a, as a mechanism to get exactly this. It's much easier for us to run our application logic inside a, a stateless layer than it is inside the stateful layer. So it actually makes sense to separate the two. And then if we want to change the one on the right, it's much easier. If we want to scale the one on the right, it's much easier. And we're actually keeping our stateful operations in the layer beforehand. But events are always going in this direction. So if we go back to this like idea of like FAS being event driven and not streaming, there's like nothing wrong with either of the, the, these patterns. They're both effectively in some ways equivalent. They just have like different performance trade-offs. So in this model, um, uh, we have like a, a FAS pr approach is like basically pretty un unopinionated on data in the most part. I mean there are some stateful functions, Microsoft have some, but they're quite limited. Um, so in the most part it's stateless and relatively un unopinionated on data. And stream processing has like much richer functionality for handling these multiple streams and tables. Um, but it's often kind of stateful as a result. So a stream processor can kind of act um, as a, a kind of data layer for these, for these uh, functions of service implementations, these serverless functions, where we're pre-provisioning uh, the data for each of these, each, each, that each function needs. And this gives us, um, uh, the core point here really is that by using a stream processor and then actually pre-creating these event streams, um, we're actually naturally flowing with this uh, elasticity that's provided by the underlying infrastructure. So that as we get more load, obviously we can then get like more, um, functions, uh, more functions running uh, concurrently and we can scale that in and out as we see fit. But importantly, and this is kind of the whole point of event streaming, is that we're actually able to deal with data that's coming from like a whole variety of different event sources. So we're not just limited to just like images in S3. We actually do more complicated things that come from a variety of different places. And we can do that actually at, at, at scale. So in a traditional application, we have a stateless application and a like stateful database. 
in an event-driven application, remember, remember these are all just patterns. In an, in an event-driven application, we might have a function. We have our data in like some other service or in like some database that we're going to query. And we basically just have a single event stream. And we're going to piece together the pieces of information that we need to do the work that we need to do. And in this streaming approach, we're actually pushing most of the stateful operations um, into the stream processor to like, pre-prepare this data and allow us to scale. So if we go a bit back to this like, original thesis, the original thesis of this talk is that like, a stream processor provides this like, database equivalent. It's not just a, a library for, for programming with. It actually provides a kind of database equivalent for real-time event-driven data. And that actually complements what, like, these ser what serverless provides. And it actually doesn't have to be serverless function it, it functions. It could be like event-driven containers, which is like a, a new thing which has come out, which is effectively the same thing, um, just not at a function level. So serverless provides this uh, real-time event-driven infrastructure, which is really about uh, giving us elasticity um, around our compute. So a couple of things before I finish. Um, these are like things I didn't tell you. Um, so there's, there's kind of two things that I wanted to, to highlight. The first thing is that um, so tools like KSQL, they provide data provisioning, but they don't provide state mu mutation. So if we have like a, a, that kind of architecture, we, we, we have no way to like do CRUD operations, basically. So we, if we're, let's say we're, we're creating something like a, an inventory service and we just need to update the inventory with some new value based on the thing that's in, in there before, we can't use that pattern. We can actually do it with the stream processor um, because we have that table that we could write to. Um, but in that pattern where the, where, the where, the, where the stream processor is running as a separate process to separate state, um, we, we can't do that so much. So it's not so good for, CUD, for, sorry, for CRUD, but it is good for data processing pipelines, many back most like back-end services as we talked about at the start. And um, it's, also, it's also obviously okay to mix and match. So on the cloud, um, I anticipate we'll see like, more people uh, doing this. We see people doing this at the moment on-premise. And the second thing is that um, Kafka service integration is, is, is still pretty much in its early stages. So there's, there's, um, you've got uh, other options online. But there's, uh, today, this is what you have. You have like a, an existing Kafka connector for serverless functions. So you can, um, you can use either Confluent Cloud or you can use your own Kafka instance. And you can use this connector to, to, um, uh, to invoke serverless func functions automatically off the back of an event stream. And obviously, you can invoke serverless functions from a whole variety of different places. Um, the Confluent Connector coming, uh, that's uh, in the works at the moment. That's actually like a, a bit smarter. It's allowing you to do uh, asynchronous and synchronous operations and actually lets you kind of chain these things together. Um, but it's not, uh, it's not integrated with Confluent Cloud yet. So if you want to find out a little bit more about this stuff, um, I talked about this paper. Peeking behind the curtains of serverless platforms. That's like a really good read. Um, this one is also really good. Again, quite forward thinking from Berkeley. Berkeley um, published like a paper on um, uh, cloud computing about like uh, uh, eight years ago. And this is like an updated version. Um, it's also really good. So this one provides context really of how they work. This provides more context, sort of general context of where the field's going. Um, my colleague Neil Avery wrote a, wrote a really good um, article on this called The Affinity Between Events, Streams, and Serverless, which kind of summarizes a lot of these points. And there's also uh, my book, which has got actually nothing to do with serverless whatsoever and is all about event-driven programming. Um, but that for, if you're interested in that, then please use that resource. Um, on that note, it's available online. The link's down there. And um, actually, there's some copies. If anyone would like a copy, there's some copies on the Confluent booth, which is sort of just by where you came in. Um, so yeah, they're free, so just come and get one. And um, yeah, so my name's Ben, ben Stopford. Um, you can find me on Twitter. Um, I tweet a bit. And uh, please use, yeah, try using Confluent Cloud if you'd like to, to, to try any of these kind of things out. Um, and thank you very much for your time.